it's a real pleasure to have Steve Bell talking to us. Steve Bell was the one inventing the, the term Lean IT. So please, a round of applause for Steve Bell. All right. Well, first of all, a big thank you to everyone that's here. This is the fifth year. And it gets better every year. And I know that because now, whenever someone asks me, well, this lean sounds like a great thing. It really does. But prove it. Show me some stories. Tell me, give me some examples. All I do is send them the link to the Lean IT Summit site and say, browse these videos and then let's talk. And the next time I hear from them, they go, wow, I like this. We need to uh, think about doing some of that ourselves. So thank you, Marie Pia. Thank you, uh, Institute Lean France. Thank you, Lean Global Network and everyone that's here uh, for giving us a, plan a place for everyone to come once a year, Paris, nice, um, to come together to learn and to develop the relationships um, it's just, as I said a couple of years ago, it's a great big annual PDCA cycle. I learn, we all learn, we come back, we share stories, we go back, we practice for a year, and we come back again. And uh, so I'm already looking forward to next year. But, but first, let's talk about this year. Um, I finally decided to tackle a topic that has been needing tackling for several years. And uh, so please bear with me. Seeing the whole, thank you, Dan, seeing the whole SDLC value stream and what it looks like. So let's start by asking the question, the question we should always start by asking, what's the problem? And why is it important? So in order to do that, let's use the A3. Let's set this up properly. The first thing is the background. Why is this important? Well. In my experience, the solution delivery speed and quality are key to digital transformation. And I'm not just talking Google and Netflix and Spotify. I'm talking the big established organizations. Um, and this requires more than just incubator lean startups, bimodal organizations that are experimenting from the inside out. Um, that work as islands within the enterprise. We need to transform the enterprise. And that requires continuous delivery, becoming a part of the overall enterprise-wide DNA. And as we heard uh, quite a bit yesterday, it's not so easily done. You can do it in the little pockets, but how do you do it globally in a very large global organization? So that's, the, that's what we're here to talk about today. That's why it's important. What is the problem? Well, the problem is there's been a tremendous amount of effort and cost invested in various very mature agile practices by very mature agile organizations over the years. But typically, the overall throughput of the enterprise product and service development is not radically transformed. It may be a little bit faster. It may be a little bit better. But can you say the whole enterprise is transformed? And generally, the answer is no. Um, furthermore, most large enterprises have fragmented, siloed, SDLC value streams, they're slow, they're costly, they don't fully engage all the creative resources of the organization, and they do not meet current or future customer needs. And they often have very complex, fragile legacy systems and architectures, and a strong control and governance posture that prevents rapid and particularly disruptive innovation. Okay. So that's the problem. And what is the target condition? The target condition is the continuous flow, not of software development, not of DevOps, but the continuous flow of ideas from the customer to delivery and realization of value. Realization of value. Okay. That's the full PDCA cycle. And sometimes, but not always, is software intervention appropriate. Sometimes we need less software and not more software. So it's not just about software. And this requires an end-to-end -end view of the overall value stream, supported by end-to-end -end visualization and collaboration, supported by quality data, quality information. As we learned from Kent Beck uh, yesterday, every question needs to be supported by data and should be visualized to help us really understand what's going on. Okay. So what's keeping us from this target? 
Well, I've tried to boil this down just to a cue, a few key things. You probably all recognize these. I'm not going to read them to you. Uh, it's a big, hairy problem. And how do we fix this? How do we get at this thing? Okay. How do we achieve an enterprise digital transformation? And I suggest that the countermeasure, the mother of all countermeasures, is that we need a shared value stream model across the ener enterprise to achieve a digital transformation. That's a big statement. What does that mean? What does it look like? Um, I've spent the last four or five years pursuing this question, and I'm just now bold and brave enough, hopefully, to uh, try and communicate to you all what I mean by that and what I've seen, what I've learned. So I want to introduce you to a fellow who just passed away recently, uh, Dr. George Box. Um, and one of my favorite quotes, all models are wrong, but some are useful. Okay. And I'm going to present to you not a model, not a prescriptive model, but a way of thinking about what such a model might look like that would help us get from here to there. And right now, you need to understand this model is not prescriptive. This is not ch check the boxes, fill in the blanks. Um, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of approaching. Okay. And uh, Mr. Box had this to say. A simple model not overly elaborate, not overly parameterized, is a good model. Something that's too complex is just a sign of mediocrity. And I think we've all been there. Okay, I know I've been there. I'll even show you what it looks like. Um, so what I want to talk about is an, what is a simple evocative model? What does that look like? What does it feel like? Well, it feels like this. There's the solar system. There's a, a hurricane. There's a rose. See any similarities? Patterns? It's an evocative model. It makes sense. And it scales, infinitely scales. So that, isn't that what we're looking for? Okay. This is not an original idea, Dan. Um, this word fractal came up about 20 years ago. And uh, the notion that enterprise value streams are fractals, okay? That at every layer of decomposition, you see self-similar patterns repeating themselves over and over and over. Well, what's a fractal? These are fractals. I ate one of those for dinner three nights ago. Literally, honestly, it was good. Um, that's a fractal, that's a fractal, that's a fractal. A fractal is an iterative or recursive construction or algorithm, a formula that repeats itself in a self-similar way that can produce amazing organic patterns at any, any level of scale. Okay, that's what a fractal is. Okay. The notion of applying fractal patterns to organizational learning was a brilliant step. It really was. It was, it was a brilliant leap. And it's buried in the back of lean thinking. Way back in chapter 11, that word jumped off the page, and, and there was a wow moment there. However, whenever I introduce the notion of fractals within an organization, there are at least a few people who go, oh, I don't get it. It's not quite right. I don't like that word. And I took that to heart, and I said, what is it about that word that isn't quite right. And what fractals are, are the same pattern repeating over and over and over again. Okay, That's not learning. It's iterative. It's recursive in some cases, but it's not adaptive. At every cycle, it doesn't adapt to the condition and then change its form, change its state, and move forward to learn. Okay, that's why enterprise value streams are, are fractal-like. But what we need is a model, a reference model, and a pattern that's fractal-like, that is iterative, but is adaptive and provides guidance for organizational learning. And that's where I think we need to go with this. 
So what does a complex <coughs> iterative recursive pattern look like that adapts to change? Well, it, you've got one right here. Now, this is how we used to think the brain worked. We used to think this phrenology was a pseudoscience uh, where different parts of the brain had different functions, okay? And we actually could map them out, okay? Um, and I think we all learned when we were younger that, uh, you know, don't drink too much because those brain cells aren't gonna regrow. You're gonna lose those brain cells. Your brain doesn't adapt. It's fixed and you, what you've got, you've got. Well, neuroscience has learned that that's not true. The brain is highly adaptive. The brain has something called plasticity, neural plasticity, where depending on what you do and think and practice on a daily basis, um, your brain actually is able to rewire itself in amazing, amazing ways. In fact, in cases of severe injury in a certain part of the brain, a certain function will reappear in another part of the brain and maybe take over another function. Um, isn't that interesting? Okay, so, so much for the brain being this hardwired thing. This brain is very plastic. It has the ability to adapt. And how does it do that? Well, there's this thing called synaptic plasticity where, and pay very close attention, synapses strengthen and weaken over time in response to increases and decreases in their activity. They learn, they adapt. And that's how we learn, and that's how we adapt. If you want to learn a new language, or learn to play the violin, or learn to play tennis, or golf, or football, or anything, what must you do? Practice over and over and over again. And how is it that you get better at it? The brain actually adapts. The brain rewires itself so that you get better at these things. It is, it is proven neuroscience. Um, so that's what we do. We practice over and over and over. Great book, Talent Code, uh, years ago, talks about deep practice, deep practice, mastery. Uh, Daniel Pink called it in Drive, where you have to go through iterations and iterations. The Shuhari cycle you may have heard about where you start as a novice, practicing the same patterns over and over again, and you graduate to the point where you master, okay? Well, what's happening here is something in the brain, and I'm not a neuroscientist, but I do play one on television, that um, there's something called myelin, and myelin sheath grows in the areas where it's used, and that's how the brain works, and that's as far as we're going in neuroscience today. But the, the thing to remember is, through regular practice, the brain rewires itself, okay? So with that, with that, what is the iterative, recursive, and adaptive practice to organizational learning, which is what we're here about? What is that? What do we practice? Anyone? What's the practice for organizational learning? ADCA, over and over and over. That's how we rewire our organization to learn, okay? What does that look like? By the way, th I know this is heavy on theory right now, but we're going to get back to the A3 because we are going to reconnect this with practice, okay? This is a very high level view of what organizational learning looks like. Simplified as three tiers, leadership, management, and the front line, the teams. And by the way, in case anybody's wondering, there's a customer down here somewhere that mostly interacts with the teams. And the farther you get from the customer, you have a vaguer and vaguer notion of what the customer really wants. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. So what happens? Well, what happens is as these PDCA synapses fire as they <coughs> practice they grow and become more effective and adapt to changing conditions not all of them but the ones that are used the most get the strongest 
the coaches that do the most A3s, the teams that do the most problem solving, the people that go to Gemba the most often, the people that have their daily stand-ups that solve problems, that tell their stories to others, they're the most active. And aren't they the ones that then tell their stories to others and that spark this viral propagation called organizational learning? Isn't that what we're here for? It's the scalable model of our internal coaching team promotes the development of the embedded coaches in the organization and they grow and they get better and these synapses fire and they get better and they get better and they learn and at some point an organization develops mastery so that you can injure any part of this model. Um, one thing Dan said the other day is, you know, one of the tests of Toyota is what happens when you leave? You might have a great lean team, but what happens when you go somewhere else in the organization? Does it fall apart? Or are you judged on the capability you left behind? And you should be able to, using a neuroscience uh, metaphor, injure any part of this model and it will rebuild itself. It can adapt, it can recover and continue to grow. And that's what we're really looking for because that's the key to sustainability, aren't we? Isn't that what we're all after? So, we have gone from a fixed model where the brain is fixed, the organization is fixed, to an adaptive model that adapts and learns and rewires based upon daily learning, daily activity. Okay, That's the target condition I think we're all looking for. How do we make that happen? Well, organizational synapses form and strengthen according to patterns of use, and we do deep practice to develop talent with intentional patterns, with practice and with coaching. You don't just start handing out A3s one day and say, everybody start doing this, because what you end up with is mimicking A3s. Everybody wallpapers of A3s. But all they end up doing, really, is backfilling A3s with solutions they already had in mind and say, well, I did an A3, it must be the answer. Well, no, that's not the answer. The answer is, through coaching, what is the problem? Why is it important? What's your current condition? Where do you want to be? What's keeping you from getting there? And what experiment shall we try first? That's the coaching model, over and over and over. It's lifelong learning that leads to adaptation and agility. The ability to pivot quickly. That's something I heard yesterday we admire about uh, Facebook. Kent back shared with us. Facebook's ability to pivot almost instantly. How do they do it? Couldn't exactly explain it, but they do. So it has to be in the organization's <coughs> DNA. It has to be about the organizational model of learning and interaction. How do you make a big bank do that? How do you make a big hospital, healthcare organization do that? Same way. So how do we apply organizational learning principles to optimize value? Because that is the focus of the lean enterprise is value, the customers. Well, I shared this slide two years ago while I was up here, and I'm going to share it again. Um, these are the principles. They've stood the test of time. And I suggest that most organizations on the lean journey are really good at one three, four, and five, uh, but they rarely get good at two. And SDLC, which by the way, in my mind, is not the software development lifecycle, it's the solution delivery lifecycle, which may or may not include software, is a key value stream of the organization. And in some industries, is the most important. Those industries right now that are relentlessly trying to digitize and transform themselves, SDLC, is the purpose of IT. And so let's dig into that a little bit more. There's this thing called organizational friction. And here's a quote I heard a while back from a client. This was one of those aha moments. Okay, What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about systemic waste. Institutionalized waste that no one individual or department can get their arms around. They just have to learn to work with it or work around it as best they can. 
And in order to get around this systemic waste that we all swim against every day, we have to recognize that there are value streams. And the only way to get at that systemic waste is to look at the value stream from end to end. Problem is, most IT organizations don't realize they have value streams. Or if they do, they don't understand it. And they certainly don't manage to it. As a result, they spend a great deal of time focused on things that don't matter. Hence the quote up here. So how do we do that? How do we see the whole value stream together so that we can start improving it? And my assertion, my hypothesis is to create value, we must learn to see visualizing flow and waste in the context of our daily work. If you're a leader, if you're a manager, if you're a team member, we need to be able to visualize that. in not in a theoretical way, but in a practical way, in a daily way. So value streams exist in an IT organization, but they're often difficult to describe. They're nonlinear, they're dynamic, and they should be highly adaptive. So how do we do that? Well, there are a lot of models out there already, and they're very good, and they're all wrong, but they're all useful. What do we do with them? Without offending the people who have bought into these, because they're, they're all good. But they're competing, and they all have specialized local optima, right? They usually focus on technical and not management issues. And if you ask why enough to a technical failure, you'll get to the fact that somewhere a management system failed that allowed that technical failure to happen. So lean thinkers will say every problem is a management problem if you dig deeply enough. Right? Because if we're not doing our jobs as managers, then things break. And none focus on end-to-end -end value. Like I said, all of these are specialized local optima. They're a piece of the puzzle, but not the whole puzzle. So we need a model founded on the idea, and this is another hypothesis, that IT is a service organization. Yes, we develop products, we deliver products. But the customer, the users, want a service. They just want an experience, right? So they don't think in terms of products as much as what they do with it, how they experience it. So a few years ago, um, I published this model. Um, not simple, hard to understand, lots of little tiny text. And I still like it. I mean, you've got underpinning technical services, operating level agreements, you've got application services, you've got customers and service level agreements and all of that. And, and it's all good, but it's too elaborate. It's not extensible. If you need to take more than 10 seconds to look at this diagram and figure out what's going on, it's too complicated. So let's try something else. This seems to work. Um, this came a couple of years later, where I looked at customer-facing services, supporting technical services to deliver those customer-facing services, and then the supporting admin services, the business of IT. And the focus should always be on customer-facing services, but a lot of the systemic waste that keep us from delivering that value to the customer is going on down below the waterline where we don't see it. But the way to get to it is to say, what are those things that are inhibiting our delivery of customer value? And that's where we do the deep dive. Okay. Still may be a little too complicated, but better. Um, and so finally, I asked, what, what is the experience of a value stream team? If I can't model how it looks, can I describe how it feels? Okay, so we have a value stream. Not an IT value stream, a value stream of the enterprise. And we have some external customers out there. Well, there are some business stakeholders and process steps along the way. If we do a value stream analysis, you might say, well, marketing is engaged, product development is engaged, production and delivery is engaged, finance is engaged. Um, and oh, by the way, there's this thing called IT. IT is engaged. They're a function of the organization, right? And we've all asked ourselves that. Why, why does the rest of the business think of IT as just a function when we know that IT itself is this framework of embedded value streams and it's nonlinear. It's very complex, all right? And you deconstruct it down into 
Well, you put a service management layer on top, and you've got your development, and you've got your operations, and then you've got however many technology stacks or pillars. And then you have this external service provider ecosystem that's helping you. Um, and then you've got models like ITIL and ITSM and Agile, and you're trying to stitch it all together with DevOps continuous delivery. Okay, That is not a simple model, but it's our reality. It's the reality we live with. So how do you, how do you think about all this in terms of value stream? Well, I like to use an old um, thought we learned back in Lean in the factory. Everybody on the shop floor should have a line of sight to the customer. Well, what does a line of sight look like? Line of sight looks like the people on the team who are the business process people, the owners, the customers, the IT service owners, the analytics people, and the coach all have this red line of sight straight through to the customer and the ability to measure the customer value. Okay? What does that look like? How do you measure it? We've heard some good um, uh, assertions today on what those KPIs might look like, customer satisfaction, reduced defects, uh, reduced lead time, thing, things like that. Good, good ways to measure it. True North. So how do you improve this? Do you just kaizen this whole ball of mud? Or do you have to break it down and find out where your key areas to focus on? Well, you need to break it down. You need to break big problems into little problems. Of course, there's business process improvement. Uh, the regular continuous improvement of business processes themselves. And of course there should be somebody from IT in every one of those Kaizen, but how often are they? They're too busy over here fighting fires, so they're not even in the room. Big mistake. We need to uh, Kaizen backlog management. Get our uh, quality going. Get our, re reduce our uh, release cycle time. We need to uh, improve the way we manage incidents and problems. Not get, get past managing them to fixing them and ultimately preventing them, right? Why manage them? That's waste. And then at a certain point, we evolve to the point where we say, let's stitch DevOps together into continuous delivery. So we get into continuous delivery flow. And then finally, the team itself, the whole lean center of excellence, the whole coaching ecosystem needs to learn and improve. A lot of kaizening going here, and occasionally a kaikaku, where you just have to take the model and break it and start over from a blank sheet of paper. And it all has to happen more or less at once. But, well, I shouldn't say that. You need to pick somewhere to start. So that's the experience, what it feels like. Here are some quotes recently from um, some senior leaders that went through a rigorous assessment. <coughs> These are people who now realize there are value streams. And this is the way they need to think about those value streams. They've learned to see the whole, and now they know they need to go about fixing it at a holistic level. Okay. That's, where, that's the first step of our journey. If senior leadership doesn't understand this, we can Kaizen down in the engine room all we want, and we'll get localized improvements, but we won't get a transformation. And if we're looking at a digital enterprise, a digital transformation, we need to be up at the top, looking at the strategic landscape. And this is the kind of realization we need to create. I'm not saying we don't start and show some quick wins, focus on hot problems, develop some capability, develop some capacity from the COE perspective. But the ship's not really going to leave the dock until we can tell those stories and understand what it means at the enterprise level, right? And we've heard from a couple of CIOs in the last uh, day or two that know exactly what I'm talking about. <coughs> so, um, SDLC is one tough mother. Everybody know Gert Boyle? 
I'm from Portland, Oregon, home of Nike and Columbia Sportswear. And this is the C CEO of Columbia Sportswear. And this is their ad, One Tough Mother. So I had to, had to plug that. And SDLC is that. And this is what a kaikaku of an SDLC, an enterprise SDLC, looks like. You spend a couple of months getting ready and then you get quite a few people in a room for a week and uh, you have some fun. Um, this particular one was an IT organization with a 600 million euro annual IT budget, about 7,000 people. They'd been working on SDLC for years, Agile, DevOps, they had all the street cred. And uh, we, we worked them over really hard and uh, had, had a good time doing it. There were definitely tough moments. The last day of the event, we brought the senior leadership team in and quote, the CIO was blown away. Despite the fact that they'd been on the Agile journey for years, this was the first time they saw end to end. Um, we'll return to this picture later and tell you a little more about what they saw and what it meant to them. So, now let's talk about countermeasures beyond the build function, beyond Agile. What do we need to do about the end-to-end -end enterprise flow to make this work? Well, um, Karen and I, a couple of months ago, published a Cutter IT Journal article. And these were the four example uh, countermeasures that we gave in the uh, journal. Um, here's a link for a free download. And we're just going to skim the wave tops on these because you've heard a lot of these already in the last day and a half. And I don't want to just read this article back to you, but the four key countermeasures we felt were important were customer experience. And we've heard the customer often isn't involved. The development team has their own ideas about what the customer wants. It's very common. How do we get over that? Go to Gemba. Love the term. Um, pain storming. You've got to feel their pain in order to empathize and solve their problems, especially the problems they don't even realize they have. Okay? And then use the scientific method. Measure, measure, measure. PDCA isn't PDCA unless you formulate a hypothesis which includes what you expect the end state to be when you finish the experiment. And then you measure what happened against what you thought would happen. And to the extent it was close, great. Your hypothesis was great. To the extent they're off, well, something's going on that we don't understand. And you repeat over and over and over. That's the scientific method. Just randomly experimenting and not learning along the way isn't the scientific method. Okay, And getting your customers involved. The second one is bridge the build and run <coughs> silos. DevOps is a very popular term. Continuous improvement, it, a continuous delivery is a very popular term. But we experience a lot of organizations out there that are using those terms but don't really understand the necessary end -to end value stream view that it requires just in build and run. Because build, rapid, run, batch. Everybody's got to run rapid batch, a rapid uh, flow. We need to get beyond incident and problem management to discipline problem solving, A3 problem solving, that will eventually lead to stabilization and problem prevention. So we need to start by an end-to-end -end value stream analysis to get there. We need to integrate legacy and cloud. Uh, the term bimodal is very popular these days. And we've heard that term a few times in the last day and a half. It is, in many cases, a necessary expedient to stand up rapid development in the cloud, to get products out there, to stay ahead of the small startups that are nipping at our heels. But ultimately, if we don't abolish the notion of bimodal and develop continuous delivery capability within the entire enterprise, we lose. It could take a while, but that has to be our vision 
It has to be our target condition. We have to take a real hard look at those obstacles in our way. Legacy systems, fragility, complexity, technical debt, process debt, rigid organizational boundaries, that sort of thing. Architecture, enterprise architecture. And I'm not just talking technical architecture. I'm talking process architecture. Enterprise value stream architecture has to be our guiding principle. What does that look like? That's a good question to start asking. Okay. And then finally, in large enterprises, we need to reduce the planning and control bias. Why is there so much governance? Why is the PMO so heavy-handed? Why do we need 37 signatures just for a small investment? Okay, why, why, why? Because processes aren't capable. They're not stable. Things are breaking all the time. So we need to slap a Band-Aid over here, some duct tape over there, some chewing gum over here. <sighs> control is like scar tissue. When you injure something, some scar tissue forms. <coughs> it makes you more rigid and more susceptible to future injury, right? But that's how scar tissue works. We need to get rid of this enterprise scar tissue. We need to understand that control needs to be replaced by process capability. And the more we invest in process capability, the less we need to control things. We'll never be able to abandon control entirely, especially in highly regulated environments. But the more we can invest at the front of the process rather than at the end of the process, the better off we are. So we need to calculate, we need to ex encourage experimentation and calculated risk taking. And where large enterprises, what they really need to think about is risk. Not avoidance of risk, but calculated selection of risk. And where we experiment and where we learn to start chipping away at this control uh, posture that is actually creating more risk than less. We all know it. We all feel it. But how do you get there from here? Uh, we can't do it alone. It has to be the whole enterprise. <laughs> Thank you, Raquel. Um, the lean elephant. Um, so how do we help a large enterprise overcome systemic challenges? to create a highly adaptive and continuously learning organization. How do we do that? It doesn't happen in a month. It doesn't happen in a year. But you have to start somewhere. So where do you start? Well, let's visualize some things. Clear things up around here. When we got this very large group of people in a room, and we spent two days on that far wall, the current state map. It was, it was almost 20 meters long from end to end and about six feet high. And you can tell from here it's covered with stickies. It's covered with pink stickies. And everybody knows what pink stickies are? They're problems. Okay. The target condition is a very small wall. This is Kaikaku. We're not incrementally improving anything. We're throwing it all away. And we, after two days of this amazing team of bright people from all over the organization, thoroughly dipped in what's wrong with why, why do we spend half the budget and consume half the time before we even write the first line of code? And it's still six months before the customer sees anything at all. They know that's broken. But what do we do? Is this fixable? No. Let's start over. And within two hours, this team had a target condition up on the board, and they broke it out into six teams, and every team had an A3. And one day, we'd cycle two A3s. So we, by the end of the third day, we had 12 A3s with a vision of where this team was going. And they, they are off and running. Okay. And now they're bringing other organizations in to say, see what we've done? Okay. You have to, sometimes you just have, that's kaikaku. That's radical transformation. And it's because we didn't do anything other than help them see the problem and then 
give them the inspiration to say, what, what do we need to do about it? Um, that's all we did. That's what a coach does. That's all a coach does. The people who have the subject matter knowledge are out there in the room, but they need your help. So when this all fits together into a management system, it ends up looking like this. Hosh and Connery, strategy deployment, if you like, where the strategic direction at the top of the organization with a long-term view of where we're going to be competitive is communicated down, but the people on the front lines and the managers need to help generate ideas, continuously improve, experiment, and produce outcomes and feedback back up. It's a kind of continuous con uh, feedback loop, big feedback loop, and it takes quite a while. It takes a lot of organi organizational maturity to get to where you can do this. But this should be your vision. You should start on the first day, like Dr. Stephen Covey said, begin with the end in mind. Begin with this in mind, and know it will take you time to get there. And how do you get there? Well, you start with a few vital KPIs at the top, and you start with problem solving at the bottom, and the leading indicators you're looking for that you're making progress in the right direction are what the teams are learning, and are the people at the top of the food chain learning what the people at the bottom of the food chain know about the customers and the problems, and are they connecting the dots in the middle? Well, the only way leadership does that is they go to Gemba. You certainly aren't going to see it in a PowerPoint presentation. Okay? You're only going to see it where it's actually happening. Well, what does this look like in practice? Because, you know, that's a pretty picture, PDCA, levels of management. Great, let's go do it. It, it starts with the A3, the problem-solving pattern. Okay? But here's the thing. An A3 at the senior level of leadership is big. We need to reduce cycle time, delivery time, by 50%. We need to reduce defects by 99%. OK, 100. Um, but what does that mean to me when I'm a, a director or a middle manager? Well, that means that gets broken down to my level and in my domain. What is my problem? And why is it important? And what is my current condition? And what do I need to do about it? What does that mean to the teams? Well, it breaks down to their level and so on. It's just cascading A3 problem solving at the level at which the problem exists at the level of the people that need to solve it. And then the catch ball of communicating and learning organization-wide are these feedback loops. The PDCA cycle at this level, daily stand-ups, weekly retrospectives. Um, at this level, manage, middle management level might be weekly, bi-weekly, monthly. And at the top level, it might be quarterly review. So the, the cycles, the, the cadence is different. But the A3, the PDCA pattern of learning, the, the organizational synapses are the same pattern anywhere. They just differ by scale. But they need to connect together. So in order to do this, A3, PDCA, needs to be a core expertise that is part of the organizational DNA. From the CEO to the CIO to the directors to the managers to the teams to the individual contributors. Now, they're not all going to learn at the same pace. There are going to be some early adopters that will be out there in front telling the stories, generating the excitement. At some point, the mass in the middle like Jeffrey Moore once said, they're like a herd of gazelle on a field. And they see a couple run, and then they all run at once. Okay, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for that uh, virality. We're looking for that. And a big problem I see uh, lean center of excellence coaching teams with is they, they work really hard with those um, early adopters. And then one day, the whole herd runs at once. And they do not know how to scale to it. They haven't prepared for it. Okay, So if you're going to begin with the end in mind, you want to assume that you're going to create a viral storm. And you'd better get ready for it. And there really is no way you can be ready for it, but you better know it's coming. Okay, So scalability, 
prepare for your COE to scale. So cascading A3s are the synaptic pathways. They're patterns of communication, interaction, and problem solving that naturally focus and strengthen the connections that are most important. Hosh and Connery doesn't mean problem solving everything. It means problem solving those vital few things that move the needle on those top level KPIs that drive the organization to excellence and innovation. Okay. What are those vital few? Well, the CIO can say what the big picture looks like, but it's down in the trenches where we really know the big picture, the end to end of what those problems are. So that the organization as a whole, like Kent said yesterday about Facebook, just suddenly Zuck gets up and says, okay, from now on, everybody's going mobile. And within a month, everybody's going mobile. How did that happen? Because it's in their DNA somehow. Okay, how do we do that in a big enterprise with established lines of communication, command and control, all that? Not so easy, but it can be done. So back to Dr. Box. Um, is this just theory? I think we've heard enough stories, we've seen enough examples to know it's not. Um, will it work for us? Only one way to find out. Um, learn. Motivated iteration between theory and practice, or someone else five years ago said it this way at the first Lean IT Summit. How we can intervene in a dynamic system to make it improve. I don't know of many more dynamic systems that need improvement than large IT organizations, maybe large healthcare organizations are up there somewhere too. But that's what we're really talking about doing. So practical questions to take back and start asking, I'm not going to read these, but think about these, ask yourself. And from the top of the chain, what does progress look like? and how do we measure it? Start with a vital few KPIs. The ones we heard earlier today are quite similar and uh, are as good as any to start. I guarantee you in six months or a year, you'll change them or you'll change the way you measure them or the way you think about them, but you gotta start somewhere. I've seen leadership teams uh, paralyzed for two years trying to find out the vital few KPIs and in that time, they could have been conducting numerous experiments and they just got wrapped around the axle, need just the right KPIs, get over it, just start experimenting. Throw a hypothesis out there and start validating it somehow with experiments. Um, great example of this, um, any of you who were here last year or saw the presentation on uh, video, there's the link, um, Fred Mathiasen at Nike in Amsterdam. Um, this is not just obey it. I mean, Obeya can be a lot of things. When Takeshi Tanaka came up here a few years ago and introduced Obeya, came out of the Prius program as a project management room, great. Fred's Obeya is a Hoshin Conry room. And Fred has several layers of cascading Obeyas that are that model we talked about, okay? And I know there are some other organizations in this room that are doing the same thing. Um, Malika and Epson that we just heard from this morning is a good example of that. Um, and by the way, Fred and his team are now uh, on iteration three. They're doing it again, five years into it, and uh, they're still elaborating. And Fred is happy to say that he doesn't own it anymore. His team owns it, okay? His team owns it. So in order to do this, and what I mean by this is Obea and Hoshin Conry and the whole integrated model, the whole learning organization thing, there are some basics that you just cannot ignore. We have learned this. That leadership intent, strategy, and engagement are necessary. That problem solving discipline needs to be like water to fish. It's just, it's just the way you think. You need to have coaching capability and capacity because coaching is the viral vector that helps this spread, not just wallpapering A3s everywhere. Visual management and a regular cadence at all levels. And I would assert that to do that in a coherent way, you need a basic value stream model to learn and evolve. Now, I am not, please, suggesting the BPM approach to a value stream model. 
do not put a bunch of smart people in a room for two years to map the known universe, okay? Start simple. And every time you bring a new problem to the table, walk into the leadership obeya and look at your current state of your value stream model and say, where does this one fit? Oh, it fits right here. Or, well, we don't know, that's interesting. What's wrong with our model that doesn't accommodate this new perspective? And after you do that, every, every time somebody brings a problem, every time you stand up an A3, that A3 should go up to the leadership obey and say, where does it fit in this model? And the leadership model of value stream organization will evolve with every experiment. That's the way to build a workable model that's kept simple enough, but not too simple. But it has to start simple or, again, to just get wrapped around the axle and, okay, we've done the value stream model, now put it on the shelf and let's go back to whatever it was we were doing before. How many of us have seen that? Okay. So finally, what do we do? Wherever you are, start there, is the old saying. Have you got a lean program that's been going for a while and you feel stuck? Um, is lean going on somewhere else in your organization and you've been asked or you want to do it yourself? Um, are you just starting? Are you watching this video or are you here in the audience saying, wow, I really want to do that, where do I start? You start where you are with what you have and experiment. And so the action plan would suggest, look something like this, conduct some sort of assessment of where you are from a leadership level. Where are you now? Where do you think you are? And what's the gap between those two? That in and of itself right there is an interesting question. I'm looking at evidence. I'm not just going around asking people, what's your opinion? I'm saying, show me where you are. And then you roll that all up together and you play it back to a leadership team. They're like, really? Well, we didn't know that. Where do you want to be? How does it support your strategy? Begin with the end in mind. What are the key obstacles at the system, at the process, and the daily level? Leadership, management, front lines. Because they all have to come together. They all have A3s. You've got systemic A3s, process A3s, daily A3s. Go back to page four of Learning to See, John Shook and Mike Rother 20 years ago, and they developed a model that's, that works to this day. What visual management, experimentation, and learning systems need to be in place to overcome them? and how to scale improvement and innovation across the enterprise. Because if you do not intend to scale this thing, then why are you starting? Once you have an assessment of where you are, then how do we do it? What are our first steps? What are our experimentations? Where do we start? And then just start. Don't be afraid. That's one thing I think we've heard from everybody in this room the last day and a half is people are just doing it. And they've somehow lost the fear of doing it. They're, they've created a safety zone around the team. And so I want to thank everybody for being here. Um, Cecil, I don't know, did I run over time? Which is perfect, right on time. You are perfect. Thank, thank you very you. much, Steve. Thank you.